Well, uh, Michael, uh, I want to thank you all for coming out tonight and spending time here. Uh, my question is, uh, when debating uh, atheists like uh, Stephen Hawking and other people like that, what is the, how, how do you convince someone like him that uh, God exists without using the Bible necessarily? Well, I was having lunch with Stephen Hawking yesterday. No, I'm just kidding. You know. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm sure your question is not specific, but we get the idea. Uh, I spent six months at Ridley Hall in Cambridge and uh, actually heard one or two lectures from him, one a very famous lecture from him at Lady Mitchell Hall in 1990 and he was addressing the issue of are we determined or are we free? And of course, Hawking is considered, the, if not the brightest, one of the brightest minds in the world of science today, which is very amazing to me. Uh, of course, uh, he can't speak because of uh, Lou Gehrig's disease. He has this uh, computer designed by a Caltech scientist and either by the cutting into the infrared ray with his eyelid or with a movement of finger, he's able to select letters, texts, and so on. And it's amazing that he, so it takes him very long to even answer a question. That's why you can ask very difficult questions and it'll take him about two or three minutes to compute his answer and his answer always is very brief. But you know, the interesting thing is if naturalism was the only worldview reigning, I wonder if Stephen Hawking would have made it this far. A scientist gave him the equipment by which he could communicate, but it was love, compassion, altruism, and generosity that cared for him and brought him through all of those years. So there were philosophical ideas behind it that protected his life. In his brief history of time, the last page, he makes something like this. He said, now I have told you what if I could tell you why, we would have the mind of God. Very interesting that he gave that little caveat, and at that time, he was attending one or two churches in the area on the weekend, and somebody told me who knew him that he was on his own spiritual search. But of course, in his uh, uh, later book, the Grand, the Grand Design, he talked about the fact that uh, gravity explains everything, and he made the very irrational and unfortunate statement that philosophy is dead. So much so theologians did not respond to him. The chairman of the philosophy department at Cambridge responded by saying, maybe it's about time the oracular Professor Hawking recognized that he's not kept up with our discipline as much as we have with his, and this kind of hostility developed. But as I told you, down the road was John Pokinghorn, the quantum physicist, who of course knows Stephen Hawking. I don't know what the answer is, how one leads him, but the answer to your specific question, how do you do it without, the ex without invoking the Bible, is really not that difficult. Because his explanation that gravity is really at the heart of it and explains everything is like me explaining a dictionary because of the alphabet. It doesn't follow. The alphabet exists, but the compilation requires design and specified complexity. It is a rather simplistic explanation to say gravity explains it all. And our colleague from Oxford, uh, John uh, Lennox, responded to Stephen Hawking in one of his books, and I think he called it Stephen Hawking's God or something to that nature. Uh, John Lennox, who has a triple doctorate and was professor of mathematics at, at, uh, at Green College, Cambridge, uh, Green College, Oxford, and is one of our colleagues on our team. So they've responded. Uh, David Berlinski, also, even though he's a natural, even though he's a skeptic, has responded. I would basically say three very simple things. Number one, however you section physical concrete reality, however you section physical concrete reality, you always end up with a state of affairs that that, that, that concrete reality doesn't explain its own existence. That physical concrete reality doesn't explain its own existence. Number two, Wherever you see specified complexity and design, you assume a designer. Number three, looking at the history of culture, humanity, and history, you see the very person of Jesus Christ coming with the prophetic scheme and the specifics of it and all the promises contained there and his transformation in the human heart. So whether you take those three stages, 
however you cut down physical concrete reality, you end up with a state of affairs that it doesn't explain its own existence. Whenever you see specified complexity or design, you assume a designer. And in the human events and course of history and culture and the human search, you see, especially in the person of Jesus Christ, the evidence of God's existence. But if you take just the first two and leave the third out, it ought to lead you to wherever the evidence actually directs you. And once you accept the existence of something non-physical that is eternal and a designer, you can go into history and the human experience and see how it is that Jesus Christ indeed has changed lives, changed history, changed hearts. And in that three stages, I think you can demonstrate the reality of a personal, moral, first cause who also offers to transform the human heart. That would be my basic response, but people like uh, Stephen, they're like uh, John Pokinghorn and all in his book, One World, have done a marvelous job of explaining it.